So I'm Tony Luck. I work in the uh, software services group at Intel in a tiny little group called the OTC, the Open Source Technology Center. So I work on enabling Linux with features of new Intel Silicon uh, and specifically processors. And we still make those. We've been hearing a lot about storage and networking and things. But uh, we make processors. And this talk is really about a feature that's a very general purpose feature. So you might not see a lot of direct storage things in after this slide. I mean, put that on the title because this was a storage talk. Uh, but yeah, it's a... We appreciate it. <laughs> It's a generic feature. Uh, it's a floor wax and a desert topping. You know, older reference people get that one. <laughs> Shimmer. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it is useful in storage, particularly in the software defined storage. We we're just talking about you can rent out those extra cores. Well, RDT can help you make sure that when you rent out those extra cores, they don't interfere with the main mission, which is the storage on your software defined storage. Lots of legal. Well, you didn't work, got it all. You work we, for Intel. We, yeah, we read fast. You read. <laughs> okay. So today we're going to talk a little bit about market trends, why this turned out to be a useful thing to do. Uh, we'll talk about the overview of resource-directed technology, uh, what problem it, it's solving, and how it does that. Uh, there's some benchmarks that external people have run that shows how great it is and how you all want to use it. And I'm a software guy, so I put in some slides on what I did in Linux. Uh, you'll notice the transition there. The nice graphics will all go away, and it will be uh, screenshots of command line interfaces. <laughs> uh, it'll be great. So market trends. Uh, there's more data. Everybody knows there's more data. It's growing. Data is the fuel of the new uh, tech revolution. Uh, we're expecting to grow 50x between 2010 and 2020. More workloads. People are cramming more onto individual servers. Uh, and there are more devices, which drives the workloads. Because as everybody connects their refrigerator and their toaster to the internet, because they want to do that, uh, there need to be more servers. And they need to monitor all that data that's coming in. Um, in the segments, enterprise, uh, people care there about you know, uh, total cost of ownership. And they care about uh, delivering things quickly. Uh, in communications, uh, software-focused architectures is becoming things, you know, uh, software-defined storage, software-defined dot, dot, dot. Um, cloud service providers, um, SLA is going to be a thing that throws up a little, service level agreement. Um, and we've been talking a lot about that earlier today as well, uh, the long tail of response times. Um, RDT is going to help that at the processor level to uh, eliminate those places where the operation takes 10 microseconds one time and 50 microseconds the next time. So we can try and get some consistency. <coughs> so yeah, this is the whole software-defined infrastructure model that's going around. People are going to buy their Intel Xeon E5 V4, uh, which is the Broadwell, if people were following along with code names. Um, and they pile a whole bunch of things on top of that one CPU. So it's uh, consolidation of workship, workloads. Um, and those workloads may have different requirements. Some people care more about latency. Some people care about throughput. Some people are just doing heavy duty computing. And to do that, you actually need to guarantee a quality of service. The people buying their time on these systems or uh, running their applications expect to see uh, the system perform in a consistent way as if they bought their own server. I mean, the, the point here is that they're renting time in the cloud, but uh, they would like oh. to get the same kind of quality that they would have got, only cheaper. Thank you. Um, well. Good so They're shared resource contention kind of is the enemy here. Uh, there's a lot of things in the server that could cause problems. Uh, earlier, talking about memory bandwidth being a constrained resource. Um, and that's one of the things that RDT deals with. Uh, last level cache, the, the shared cache across all the cores, is the other key one that RDT is tackling at the moment. So yeah, Intel's working everywhere. A big marketing slide. Uh, <laughs> there's me up there, the little penguin, uh, doing Linux. 
So here we've got a picture of the problem. The little boxes at the bottom there shows how the cache is being distributed between these three separate VMs that are running on the application. And this one is looking like it's not doing too badly. We've got you know, the purple ones coming from the enterprise app and they're dotted around the cache and the communications people are also spread around and the cloud guy is spread around. Everybody's looking like they got a fairly even share of the cache. Um, it might not be optimum from the uh, SLAs that you were promising these different people. Maybe some people needed more to get their performance. And in particular, we have this problem of the noisy neighbor. Um, if some guy comes along here and he is streaming through memory, uh, he can fill up that cache in you know, a millisecond or two, and that is going to be bad news for everybody else who is running on the same system. Um, and we'll come up with some figures to justify this bullet down here. Last level cache can put a 51% throughput degradation in your comms workloads. So here's a uh, ex um, specific benchmark that was uh, run on systems. Uh, again, the no noisy neighbors showing what's going on here. Uh, we have a whole lot of different workloads going on, and the blue line across at the one mark is the nothing else was happening on the system. That's the expected performance of this system. But as we see a bunch of different uh, runs of this workload, we see sometimes we meet that or very fractionally above it. But there are these giant outliers. Up here, we're 5x slower than the normal expected time. Um, and you know, people who are renting time on the system would not like that, say, oh yeah, today it ran at 1x and the job was all finished in time. And tomorrow, they rent the system and the same job takes five times as long, doesn't complete in time to meet their deadline or make their customer happy. So, yeah, the solution is RDT. RDT is being rolled out, you know, one piece at a time, coming on different generations of CPUs. So the first one that came out was on the V3, uh, cache monitoring. Um, unless you can measure your problem, it's really hard to do anything about it. So um, previously, we've had lots of counters on systems that can measure cache misses on the system as a whole. Um, and you can even track them to processes to some degree. But what you couldn't do is find out how much cache a given task running on the CPU was consuming. Uh, none of the perf counters would directly give you that number. You could see how many cache misses it got, how many things it filled, but there was no tracking of the evictions from the cache. So you could see it was dragging lots of stuff into the cache, but how much of it was staying there, how much was being pushed directly out again. So cache monitoring technology allows you at an individual process level to say, OK, every time you pull something into the cache, count a little bucket, and keep running, more things get going. Even when you're not running, all those cache lines you pulled in were tagged with your particular billing ID. So as they get pushed out, you decrement that little counter. So you can come along and say, OK, let's start monitoring this process. And we can see all the cache allocations he's done. And we can see how much being pushed out. So we can take a snapshot and say, oh, he is currently using 12 megabytes of the last level cache. So the monitoring is great. You can now see what's happening to your system. Uh, with the Broadwell, the Xeon V4, uh, you get cache allocation technology. This is where you start doing something about the problem. And here we show a little kind of slider kind of thing. We have the high priority process, the low priority process. And we kind of trying to show here that maybe you can say, let's reserve 3 quarters of our cache for that high priority guy and 1 quarter for the low priority guy. And you know, we just heard just now how uh, with this uh, previous kit, they were limiting the cache accesses from their core because they didn't want it to interfere with everybody else. It didn't really need a lot of cache. Uh, a lot of the data it's moving is streaming through, so it's not reusing the data. Block comes in, they give it to the guy who wants it, they never touch it again. Why keep it in cache? Mm. Pointless. So you, he's the kind of guy you'd say, oh, no cash for you, or as little as I can give you and get away with it. Uh, meanwhile, somebody who's doing something where he's doing a lot of chasing around of pointers and uh, big database kind of operations, he might actually be able to use a big cache because he's in fact going back to the same data over and over. 
And um, this box on this slide currently talks about the existing telemetry. Uh, you'd imagine that there was going to be another one there to control memory bandwidth as well. Uh, and if you read the software developer manual, you'll see that's spec'd out. Uh, it's not shipping in a product yet, but uh, memory bandwidth control is coming soon. A couple questions on the monitoring. Are you yeah. stealing any cycles to get that done? If, if, I'm sure it's low, but if, is it measurable? Um, it costs us a right to a, uh, an MSR during context switch because you need to say, okay, with the process we were running, as we switch from one process to a new process, we need to update an MSR that says, okay, this is the billing ID for this process. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about the current slides. Um, but the actual overhead, no, while the process is running, nothing. The hardware is just doing that counts. It's built into the cache mechanism. So you don't see a slower <coughs> cache access because you're monitoring it. And, and as far as the cache allocation tech, is there a way to compile time for an application to subscribe to some level of high, high priority or low priority cache? Um, not a compile time thing. Um, I, I'll talk later in the slides about the Linux mechanism we provide to uh, assign processes into different cache categories. The application itself can't do it. The application, uh, well, it can use the Linux methodology, okay. and we provide a file system interface. Cool. Yeah. So a little more detail on each of those. So you know, cache monitoring, uh, we're specifically just trying to measure how much cache each process is using, um, and that is a number that fluctuates as it process runs, it pulls into the cache. While it's not running or other processes are stealing things from it, the value can go down. Uh, in cache allocation technology, we divide the cache up and we say this much for one guy, this much for another guy. So in this one, we've got a 25-50-25 split going on. So, so when you say last level cache, you're talking L3 or L1? Uh, L3, uh, last in my, is furthest I away see. from the CPU, so. Just a question, yeah. Yeah. And that's, you allocate 25% to the yellow app, whether he uses it or not. Whether he uses it or not, yep. So you need to be sure about this. Why cache <clears throat> monitoring is useful, so you understand what his needs are, and you can then give him a reasonable amount. Uh, can, you can also can those around. change while the processes are running? It can change while you're running, yes. You can update that fraction at any point. So you can, uh, and I'll have an example coming up on a slide soon where you dynamically do stuff. You realize somebody is not running very well or somebody is coming who's a bad guy who's using up too much cash and you change the parameters. Find is a consistent correlation between last level cash and first level cash utilization or? Uh, first level caches are tiny, they're only like 8, 16k a piece, so no, there's no, um, I, I don't know of any measurements that would show how you, your initial cache compares with the mid-level cache and the last level cache. And mid-level is more important now and it's become bigger in recent CPUs, uh, but the first level, the, the, the L1 cache is a tiny thing that's just, you know, filling and flushing. Uh, there's no control or measurement in this. It will be almost futile to try it because the whole cache can be blown away in you know, uh, sub-microsecond kind of time frames. So the allocation that you're doing doesn't necessarily apply to the cache hierarchy. It only applies to the level three cache. Um, in this generation, yeah, it's applying to the last level cache. So you can say, yes, we're dividing this up. And it's the area where you care the most because the last level cache is being shared by all the cores on a socket. So 22 on a V4, um, 22 on the E5 and 24 on the E7. Uh, so there's a lot of contention there. The L2 and the L1 caches are only shared by the threads on a core. So there's only two guys pounding on it. Mm. Uh, the problems, I mean, there's still problems involved with it, but it's not as bad. There's only one guy stealing your lines as opposed to 44, 43 other guys stealing your lines. Okay. Um, and memory bandwidth monitoring, we're just trying to show here that the, uh, everything ends up in a little queue. I mean, there's actually multiple queues because we have two memory controllers and each memory controller has multiple channels, but every one of those ends up with stuff is lined up. So you may be stuck waiting for three or four other things from other apps coming along trying to read uh, and you, you're stuck waiting until their read completes before you, your one is delivered down to the DIM to actually get the data back. Um, so yeah, with memory bandwidth monitoring, you get to uh, understand the problem 
Uh, in a future generation, as defined in the manual, you, you'll be able to provide memory bandwidth allocation where you'll be able to say, this process, do not let him use more than 20% of the memory bandwidth, or do not let him have more than 40% of the bandwidth. Uh, and that will you know, limit the damage that uh, the noisy neighbor can do. What kinds of, I shouldn't say workloads, but environment situations do you see this being most useful for? Would you say like big analytics, <coughs> shared analytics <coughs> environments, like in the cloud or something like that? Uh, yeah, a lot of cloud applications, particularly if somebody's doing a virtualization of a server, so they're sharing it out between a lot of people, but they want to guarantee some kind of service level agreements to them. So you don't want to end up on a system next to somebody who is streaming through memory <coughs> doing like a video transcode or something. They use the optimization, not necessarily a billback. Um, I mean, you could potentially be able to bill higher for providing a uh, consistent level of service, or bill lower if you provide somebody with the cheap low-end virtual <coughs> system uh, where they didn't care too much about it, it was just a batch job, they expect it to run overnight, and they want the result in the morning, they could pay less for right. a system which didn't guarantee any... Well, estimates. I was thinking more if you had like 10 different analytics loads from 10 different customers, they're all going to have slightly different profiles of how they use the different resources in a mm -hmm. cluster, and so you could be able to build them based on what their, what they, their load looks like very specifically. Uh, right? I, I guess so, yeah, yeah. So the attributes of the system are that it's all based on this model-specific registers. Uh, we use them to control uh, what the billing ID is for a process while it's running. So that's one that gets used on every context switch. There are also some <coughs> other ones that are used to read the data back out again at the time that you actually want to take a snapshot and see where things are. Um, as such, it can be used directly in the OS, so I implemented it directly in the Linux uh, core kernel code. Uh, it could be done in a hypervisor. It could be done just as a set of applications. You can, uh, and uh, Intel provided a set of example code on 01.org that just write the MSRs directly from Linux user mode tools. That, and there's a device driver that allows you to patch MSRs. And so there they could use it to control uh, or measure and control the cache and the memory uh, on a core by core basis, but without uh, the OS uh, being able to do the switch at the context switch time, those tools can't provide you the per thread granularity unless you're also binding tasks to specific cores. Um, and yeah, there's lots of uh, expected uh, places that's going to be used. Um, it's an architectural interface, so uh, it's now on, it started on Haswell, Broadwell, the V3 and the V4. It's going to continue on to future uh, processor generations. Um, so everything should look almost all the same. The last bullet there about the parameters, parameters are included in the CPU ID. So the <coughs> granularity, when you divide the cache up, uh, I showed it with a 25-50-25 split, the actual granularity will be model specific. So in the Xeon V4, you can actually divide up by 5% slices. So there's a, you know, the, the granularity is 20, uh, 20 bits of uh, bit mask, and you can set those to say which areas of the cache are allowed to be used. Um, but that means you can tighten somebody down to use just 5% or 10 or 15. Uh, in other generations of CPUs, that number could change. We could have more, we could have less. So you might find there are only like 16 different ways and you get a 6% granularity, or maybe there'll be more. Um, and a uh, question came in just now, can you change that? Yes, you can change these parameters at any time. So you can take a process that's using too much uh, and squeeze him down. Uh, you can also use that as a measurement technique. You can run the benchmark and see how fast he's running and gradually turn the knob, squeeze him down, squeeze him down, squeeze him down, see what his performance does, see how much he can take. Because uh, maybe you don't really know quite how, how the cache availability affects his performance. So you, uh, that way you can find out you know, the knee in the curve. At some point it's too much and the performance collapses and then you just ratchet it back a couple of steps. And yeah, we threw in a storage slide. So, um, 
<laughs> I think the, the software defined storage is the key place where you can do this, where you're going to be running other apps on your storage node because you know, you've got the CPUs there, they're not using up all their capacity. You might as well use those cycles for something else, but if your main mission on that node is storage, you want to make sure you guarantee the storage performance. So you can first measure and then control to make sure that the app... R rather that, than allocating a whole core to storage, you would actually do it through monitoring and allocating the L3 cache? Um, yeah, for any cases where the L3 cache is the critical, or the memory bandwidth is the critical part to the uh, overall or system performance. Device, would memory bandwidth um, not be a critical path? Uh, probably it always is, maybe. I don't know. Outside of storage, maybe there are other apps where you may have different uh, limiting factors. I mean, there's, there's always whatever is fills up first is controls your overall performance. So you, you may just run out of CPU cycles to complete what you're doing if you're very CPU intensive. It's probably not a storage case because in storage, really, you're getting rid of the data as fast as you can. You're not crunching a lot, except in the case where you were you know, compressing the data as it went by, then maybe you will become a bit more intensive in the CPU cycles. And yeah, we're all about trying to control tail latencies, trying to give that 99.9999% guarantee of how, what, how you're going to do. So back into how it works. So we have this thing called the resource monitoring ID. This is the thing that you have four per logical thread, so 160-ish on a uh, single socket Xeon, um, and it's your billing ID. Um, when the process runs, you load that RMID into this uh, thread scoped MSR called the PQR ASOC, very catchy name. Uh, so you say, okay, we're starting to run this process. His billing ID is 23, load the 23 in there. Now everything he does, all his cash allocations are gonna be counted uh, and all of his cash allocations are gonna be tagged with that 23 so that later on if they're pushed back out again, we know to decrement the cash count for billing ID 23. And then when we want to find out what was going on, uh, we use this pair of MSRs to get the data back out again. So we load in the RMID that we care about, 23, and the event ID. The event ID is either the cache allocation, you know, cache occupancy, or the memory bandwidth local, or the memory bandwidth total. Uh, once we've loaded that in, make a write to that register, then we just read out of the count register, and it gives us the current counter for that ID for that event. So it's a very you know, basic interface, but you know, you can build a lot of complex software on top of that. And then the class of service is about the control. So the resource monitor is all about uh, monitoring what's going on. Uh, in the class of service, it's about control. We have fewer of those, uh, 16 on the uh, Xeon V4. So you can't uh, set up an individual customized cache policy for every process on your system. You're only going to have 16 total policies. So you probably end up with a few very tight, small cache segments <coughs> for your noisy neighbor kind of guys, and maybe some bigger, policy, bigger pieces of cache policies for the guys that are paying the big bucks, or they're the ones for the prime mission for this particular server. Exactly the same thing happens, though. Um, we write that clause ID into the same MSR. Um, so that means that when we're doing the context switch, we only have one MSR right to control both the monitoring and the control. And then that field, the clause ID field, is used to control potentially multiple different um, resources. So right now, we only have implemented in Xeon v4 the cache mask. So that clause ID field, so if we had value two in there, it would index into this array of MSRs and we'd use the second one down, which gives this bit mask of which parts of the cache he's allowed to allocate in. So you know, if he was only allowed to allocate into the bottom 10% out of a 20-bit field, the bit mask would have ones at the bottom end and everything else would be zeros. Uh, but the same index is used into future resources, so the memory bandwidth allocation 
This one, the allocation value is a percentage of the memory bandwidth allowed to be used. So your clause ID value two may be selecting a particular cache mask and a particular memory bandwidth at the same time. So you'll have to pair those together. Uh, it does mean that as you explore all the possible options, you might think you're going to run out of clause IDs pretty quickly because if you want to have a lot of guys with very high bandwidth and small caches and low bandwidth and small caches and medium bandwidth and so on, those kind of multiply out. Um, we don't have a lot of data back because we're not shipping a system that <coughs> does both things at the same time. The uh, cache allocation thing, people seem to be doing okay so far with just 16 different classes. So at UC Berkeley, they've been playing around with this uh, and running some benchmarks, trying it out. And they were specifically looking at network-centric things. So we go with off the storage track here, but you know, storage and networking are pretty tightly combined. Maybe it's still slightly interesting. So the first one they looked at here was the um, throughput. Uh, and this is the before graph. Uh, we see that the throughput of various applications when being uh, presented with a noisy neighbor, a noisy neighbor is this snort part uh, thing up at the top there. Um, and some things were not very badly affected at all. Some things managed to still get just a 2% degradation or a 4%, not too bad. But a bunch of other things were up in the 30s, 40s, even 50% <coughs> slower because the snort process was stealing all their cash. And so, we use cat. We tell the snort process, it gets a billing class or a class of service ID that only allows it to use this end part of the cache. So he's restricted to this part. He can't disturb what's going on the rest. And the numbers get fabulously better. I mean, our worst case now is a 2.3% degradation. Uh, a lot of people down in the ones and uh, Maznat is uh, no degradation at all. You managed to fit in the other part of the cache without being disturbed at all. Um, this next one is talking about uh, latency. Uh, in fact, uh, is it worst case or just latency? Um, and the before and after are showed together. So here are like the red lines are the before, and notice there's a log scale. So our um, improvement as soon as we turned on CAT here was to drop this latency from 4.6 milliseconds down to 7 microseconds. Um, again, this one here from 7.3 down to effectively nothing. Are there actually function calls that you measured inside? Network uh, function calls. How, how, what, what is actually seven? Um, this is the packet latency as observed on the network, I oh. believe. Well, okay. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of fine print you can't read at the bottom there, saying and referring you to the HP, uh, the Berkeley. Uh, yeah, but I think it's all about important. packet latency on the network. And so, yeah, we're getting uh, worst case latencies from the milliseconds being dropped way down into the microseconds just by limiting this uh, process to stop him stealing all the cash. And here's where uh, AppFormix came up with a feedback kind of system. So they were looking at uh, using both the cache monitoring and the cat. Uh, in a feedback loop to monitor the performance of a system. Um, and so they plotting a graph of what's going on and they see some big spike happen when the noisy neighbor process starts out. Um, and they say, oops, that looks bad. Uh, and so they reconfigure the cat to limit, to partition the cache and make sure the noisy neighbor is, in this case, limited down to the <coughs> left-hand edge, few buckets of cash, uh, and everything gets way better. Um, in terms of server performance on this Nginx web server benchmark, they saw an you know, increase of requests per second going up from 800 to about 1,100. 
the average latency of those web server requests dropping from the mid, uh, low 30s down to 22, uh, and the worst case dropping from 450 milliseconds latency down to 200. So again, say uh, getting rid of tails on systems. Um, this is another benchmark that was run. Uh, it's a network function virtualization. This just shows how you can uh, set up the network function across a series of cores that are each responsible to part of the processing, uh, the DPDK at the front end, the classifier, the routing, and then the DPDK transmit at the far end. Um, by packaging four of those together onto a server, and then measuring the effect on the system when you introduce a noisy neighbor kind of process, uh, you can see that the network throughput drops in the middle with the unmanaged noisy neighbor from 66 megabyte mega packets per second to 41, um, and then enabling CAT uh, turns it back to almost the full throughput again, 64. So now there's a bunch of resources of where to start learning about this. On intel.com, there's an RDT page that's got a bunch of features and blogs and links and explaining what's going on newswise with RDT. Um, and uh, the patches to perf and Linux kernel are probably now outdated because those things are now all in the upstream Linux kernel. Um, in the software developer manual hidden around in volume 3B down towards the end of volume 3B in chapter 17, section 17, there's a lot of fancy diagrams showing exactly how all these uh, registers work. So some examples of how you could set up uh, capacity masks um, and you know, generally use the feature. Um, and you know, Linux is fully enabled now. Uh, other systems are being worked on. A um, bunch more links of places to find stuff. So this is the bit that I uh, was working on. So the cache monitoring technology was enabled in the Linux kernel version 4.2. Uh, memory bandwidth went into version 4.6 and Hot off the Git trees, still warm are the bits for in version 4.10 for CAT. Uh, and the availability in specific Linux distributions will depend on where they start picking those up from upstream. These are all you know, Linus Torvalds trees. This is where Intel works to enable things first, and other people will pick them up as time goes by. You know, Ubuntu will be releasing. Uh, in next month, the 17.04 release, it's apparently going to have a 4.10 kernel, so it should have all of these things enabled. Uh, other systems will backport or move on at their own paces. So here, command line stuff. Um, so the CMT is enabled via the perf command on Linux. So um, here's an example measuring the occupancy of a fictitious workload that's busy just going to try and fill up the cache pretty quickly. Um, so the perf stat command uh, allows you to show out uh, the data at an interval. The minus i flag provides a millisecond value, so every one second here. We're going to look at the event called uh, LLC occupancy, and we'll see in the first second the app was still doing some setup. Uh, and by the second second, it had filled the LLC cache. All 62 megabytes are busy and, and being occupied by this workload. Um, memory bandwidth also comes through the same perf command, uh, just the names of the events are di different. So as I mentioned earlier, there are separate events for the local bytes, as how much is being transferred from the local memory controllers and how much is going uh, to the total system, and a subtraction of those tells you how much is heading out over the QPI bus. Again, same workload, so it's skimming through memory rapidly, so uh, initially not much happens in the first second while it's doing some setup, and then uh, it picks up speed and is pulling seven gigabytes a second. Uh, we notice it's a fairly well-behaved NUMA benchmark because the total bytes is only fractionally higher 
then the local bytes, or almost all the traffic here is going to the local memory controller. And by second three, I think it's pretty much maxed out the bandwidth. So you asked earlier about how we actually configure CAT to different processes. Um, it's done via a file system because you know, Linux is derived from Unix and everything's a file system. Um, so we have this resource control file system. And when you initially mount it, you discover that there are a few files in there. Um, and we'll dig into them one at a time. The first one is the info directory, which contains in it the parameters for this particular system, that which we got from the CPU ID uh, in the silicon. So we can see on this system, the cache bit mask uh, is the thing that describes how many different, how much control or the granularity of control that you have for the L3 cache. In this case, we get the five Fs, hex number, so that's 20 bits total, so that's how, where the 5% comes from. You can control at a 5% granularity. Uh, and the number of clause IDs is 16, that's how many different classes of service you can set up simultaneously. Um, the schemata file for each class of service is the one that describes, for this class of service, how much cache can you use and because a multi-socket system has a completely independent L3 cache on each socket, um, it will uh, allow you to control that for each one of the sockets. So this is on a four-socket system, and we see that on uh, this is the baseline setup. Uh, you're allowed to use all the cache on all four sockets. But by editing this file for this class of service, you can change those values to whatever you like. Um, And then making a new class of service. So initially, when you mounted the file system, all the processes were in the default class of service. Uh, the schemata file is available for the default class of service too. So you could squeeze down the default class of service and say, OK, he can only have 50% of the cache, and then I'll divide up the other 50% between my specific categories. You can you know, slice and dice whichever way you want. There's no uh, real restrictions about how things uh, overlap except that the hardware insists that these bit masks have series of consecutive bits. So you can't have a 101010 to have every alternate way. If you're going to have 50% of the cache, it has to be 10 ones next to each other. Uh, they could be the first 10, the next 10, or the last 10, but you can't uh, do arbitrary bit masks. And Linux enforces that. If you try and write one that's not going to allow, then it'll tell you that you can't. So here we're setting up a new class of service. Uh, we called it CG1 class group 1. Uh, and so it then had a, its own schemata file. Uh, we rewrote the schemata file with this very small class of service, just the bottom two bits set uh, across all four cores. Um, we could have chosen to do different things on different cores. Uh, and then we assigned our current process to this class of service. Uh, dollar dollar is the process ID for the current shell. So when we wrote that to the tasks file in there, it moved us out of the default class of service and into this class of service. And if we look at the tasks file for this class of service, we see two processes. Uh, wait, we only just assigned, we made this and we assigned our shell. Why are there two? Uh, what well, class of service is inherited by ch child processes. So the first one of those is our shell, and the second one is the cat process that was reading the tasks file. But that makes life very easy for you when you're setting things up, because if you're going to assign a whole container or a VM to a class of service, you just need to put the initial process in, and then everything else that that process, every other process that's made gets inherited. And then does it work? Well, we can use the uh, cache occupancy to measure what's going on. So now running inside that limited class of service, we run that same workload we did earlier with the same command line and saying, let's monitor our, monitor our cache occupancy. And as before, in the first second, we're doing some setup. We're only getting about a half meg. Uh, but by second two, we've filled up what we're allowed to get. Instead of 60 meg, we're only getting six meg. So our uh, workload is now pinned to those bottom two bits of the cache. 
uh, and is uh, running, ha not maybe happily, but running uh, as well as we're allowing it to do. So it is not going to interfere with anybody else who's trying to use the other 90% of the cache. And because not everybody likes uh, command lines and hex numbers as the interface, uh, we, I don't know if we're going to uh, distribute this GUI, but uh, one of the guys in the office put together a bit of Python in a half day that shows how you can divide things up with a fancy GUI, well, a very unfancy GUI because it was only a half day. Uh, but here, uh, there's a couple of interesting things that show up on this one is that um, partitions don't have to be completely distinct. You're allowed to overlap things. So on this one, it was for a two-socket system, so we show that we have different configuration on socket one from socket zero. Um, in both cases, we kept the default partition as being able to access all of the cache. Uh, on this socket, we said our first partition is allowed to have 50% of the cache, and it shares with the default guys, but it doesn't share with anybody else. The, there's totally different uh, areas of cache. But we do have overlaps between our other partitions. Um, not sure if this is a particularly useful case, um, but it shows the capabilities involved. You may have things that you allow to interfere with each other, uh, but don't interfere with a third thing or a fourth thing. And one of our goals is to get this integrated into OpenStack. So OpenStack will be able to do the same kind of things. It will look at a system. So here we've got a system set up, uh, or a, a cluster set up with three particular hosts. Uh, host B is an ancient system pre-CAT, so it's not going to partake in this. Uh, but host A and host B are both <coughs> running uh, a CAT-enabled system, or a CMT and CAT-enabled systems. And the system notices that up on host A, um, poor little VM1 is really struggling. He's only got a tiny amount of cache available. And we also noticed that over on host C that uh, VM9 is using up some cache, but there's a lot of spare capacity down here. So OpenStack says, let's fix that. Let's move a VM. And so VM1 slides down and now He's uh, running in a much happier environment where he's going to have enough cash to meet his needs. <sighs> many more links. <laughs> so many links. Can you read those to us? <laughs> you want all of those? Yeah. Um, in binary. <laughs> just, just double click them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just tap on the screen. <laughs> no. yeah. 60 tabs. Here we go. <clears throat> Grow. So, in summary, consolid uh, because we've got large numbers of cores now that are all competing for resources, for cache and for memory bandwidth, as we consolidate workloads onto single systems, uh, th those resources can become bottlenecks and they can impact, impact performance. Uh, both they cause large amounts of variability in the performance and uh, sometimes you can get excessive latencies because yeah, everything has been stolen or from you. Uh, RDT gives you a very fine-grained way to examine and control the problem because we can look at things on a per process or per task per thread level if it's a multi-threaded app uh, and control uh, or measure how much cache they're using, measure how much bandwidth they're using and control both of those. Um, so you can write better policies to meet SLAs um, we have some initial results in from people using this out in the field. Uh, and you know, this is going to continue. This feature is going to be on future generations, and probably more resources are going to be added, like the memory bandwidth coming soon.